Hello, I'm Askar Shirli. If you're watching news from Kazakhstan and here are the headlines. Ex-head of the statistics agency Anar Mishimbaeva was detained in Moscow. She was wanted internationally since 2009. Chief reader of the Republic newspaper Tatiana Trubachova was fined for 20 MCIs, all because her name was indicated in the newspaper. Restaurant keepers oppose the initiative of Epidemiological Control Agency to ban smoking of hookah in public places. The ban might take effect in a year. Ex-head of statistics agency Anar Mishimbaeva was detained in Moscow. Financial police declared former state official internationally wanted almost four years ago, ch charging her in multi-million embezzlements of budget assets during the national census. This is how the head of statistics agency commented on the criminal case in regard of her former deputies Nurlan Bayanov and Birlik Mindibayev at that time. The charges are groundless as the budgeting was performed in coordination with the Ministry of Economics and further approved by the RBC agency, so many experts just couldn't be wrong. The high-ranking official fled the country right after being accused of embezzlement of $5.3 million allocated for the population census. Last year, the deputy prosecutor general officially stated that Mishimbaeva had been residing in the United Arab Emirates. The public prosecution made several attempts to convince the Arabian party to extradite the criminal fugitives. However, Mishimbaeva ended up being arrested in Moscow by the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs under the International Commission of the Kazakhstan government. Mishimbaeva has been placed at the temporary detention facility number one of the Moscow Department of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Currently, the officials are taking legal measures to expedite the detainee's extradition to Kazakhstan. The claimants for the apartments of evicted interest holders arrived to the Astana Department for execution of court orders on Thursday, demanding the court marshals to continue the evictions. People want to quickly move into the selected apartments by the state. They're also dissatisfied with the failure of court decisions that they've been achieving for many years. According to government decree issued in 2010, cheated interest holders whose apartments were built by the state are entitled only for single housing. Forced eviction of 36 families that own several apartments began last week in three residential complexes in Astana. On Wednesday, the MPs finally intervened and suspended the evictions. Yet the leadership of the housing department refused to talk to the gathered people. Interest holders threatened to settle in their apartments by force unless the new occupants vacate them voluntarily. I've been knocking on doors, walked around crying, yet nobody cares. No one has contacted me or tried to negotiate. I'm inclined to appeal to the court. I cannot be sorry for them because nobody felt sorry for my baby when I ran around with him trying to solve the issue. The case of Tatiana Trubachova, chief reader of Republic newspaper, was examined by the court in Almaty. It ruled that just her name in the list of the editorial staff of the new newspaper is a violation. Last year, she worked in the band weekly Golos Respubliki. Court discussed the arguments concerning the fact that there was no ruling for the ban of profession. As a result, Rubachova was fined, but she plans to appeal the decision. On Thursday, the editorial staff of the newspaper Republic held a protest action at the court building in support of the prosecuted colleague Tatiana Trubachova. That's how the ideal model of Kazakhstan journalism works, as seen by the authorities. When we see nothing, hear nothing and say nothing. The court session on the case of the chief reader of the Republic newspaper Tatiana Trubachova started off with a seven-hour delay. No posters are allowed inside the courtroom. I'm a court-martial. The presiding judge, Galim Kildibayev, turned out to be a brother of the surgeon Adil Kildibayev, who was once in litigation with the currently forbidden newspaper Vzgled. Another curious coincidence was the prosecutor Autalipov's past involvement in the lawsuit against the Golos Respublika newspaper taken down in December 2012. However, the recusal motion against the biased official was immediately rejected. I have a right to read a newspaper and I wrote about it in the dateline. Why your name is indicated in the newspaper's dateline? Because I read it. I also read it, but my name is not indicated there. I can write down your name too. The witness hearing took 40 minutes. The provided evidence appeared sufficient for the prosecution to charge Tatiana Trubachova, listed as the chief reader of the Republic's imprints, with direct involvement in the new mass media publication. The resembling designs of the Republic newspaper and the forbidden Golos Respublika publication served as major grounds for conviction.
Even the volunteer resignation copy dated the end of December 2012 presented in court by Tatiana Trubachova failed to convince the judge of her non-involvement in the Golas Respublikis operation. The prosecution office, the court marshals are trying to hinder my professional activity. Moreover, they are not allowing me to read a newspaper. And just because I am indicated in the newspaper as the chief reader, I am being held responsible. Even though the title of the chief reader is not indicated in the law. If prosecutors and marshals would spare some time to read the laws, they would know about it well. Judge required no deliberation to return a guilty verdict against Tatiana Trubachova and hold her liable to a fine of $230. The law on elections needs to be amended. This idea was voiced by the MPs during a roundtable in Astana. Among the initiators of changes are Nuratan party members. Find out what do they have to say in the next report. Aigul Salaviova, who got a seat in the parliament based on the majority voted system and then as a candidate from Nuratan party, proposed changes in the electoral law. I agree that the 7% system is too high. This threshold needs to be decreased because the decrease will allow other parties to receive financial aid from the government. Currently, only three parties get a financial aid from the government because they have passed the 7% threshold and they are receiving the financial support required for their operational activities. The communist Nurjau Kosharbayev, however, is nostalgic about the proportional system. He believes that the advantage of such a system is an almost even representation of political forces depending on voters' popularity. It also allows the minority to have their people in the parliament. If we take Germany as an example, we'll see that one part is based on the proportional system and the remaining one is based on the majority voted system. I believe it would be reasonable for us to adopt their practice. Some citizens who are not members of any party also need to exploit their potential and bring their ideas to life. I think this would allow socially active citizens to show themselves or win an election. Political analysts note that the major problem of the Kazakhstan's parliament lies in the domination of the ruling party, although on paper the chamber is considered multi-party. Similar methods were last used in the world in the past century. If we look at other governments, we will see that domination of one party is practiced only in Kazakhstan, Russia and Azerbaijan. Even Paraguay refused from domination of one party as late as in 2008. If we look at the composition of our parliaments, we will see that despite the equality among party fractions, the lawmaking process is entirely in the hands of the ruling party. Latest parliamentary elections were held in Kazakhstan in January last year. According to election results, parties such as Nuratan, Akzol and public communists received seats in the parliament. Opposition represented by Social Democrats have failed to pass the 7% threshold. The Unified Pension Savings Fund is a guarantee of insured old age. The new level of reforms raises new questions. On the one hand, it is just a technical step which will not change the general structure. On the other, the process of discussion is closed, which raises doubts. Opinions in the next report. According to the former Deputy Finance Minister Oraz Randosov, it is possible to establish a unified pension savings fund by the summer of 2013. From a technical perspective, the consolidation of separate pension funds is the right decision, as in 15 years they have not shown any good work done. Moreover, it would pose minor systemic risks and reduce administrative costs. Since September 2011, the government has made numerous unsuccessful attempts to solve a key problem of accumulating sufficient funds for adequate pensions. Unfortunately, a unified state pension fund will not help either unless the humble rate of 10% pension contributions is raised. In the meantime, the current Deputy Prime Minister Kairat Kilimbetov's statement on a unified pension fund establishment fueled questions in the parliament. Deputies wonder why such decisions are not brought to public discussions. MP Guljan Karagusova, who headed the Ministry of Labour and Social Security for six years, admits that the process is really closed, even for the parliament. It is too early to give an assessment of the Unified Pension Fund when we haven't seen it. Everyone is asking why we are not talking about it, but how can we speak of something we have no idea of? A Unified Pension Fund may have different tasks and models and can be anything. Let's see what it will be like first. 
Darika Nazarbayeva also has a bone to pick up with officials. Figures seem to be looking good, but in reality current pensions are too little to live on. We will all be retired one day, but I don't want people to have the idea that it is next to impossible to live on pension alone. Meanwhile, according to the Ministry of Labour, over 2 million of employed population are not making pension contributions. Officials believe that new reforms and creation of a unified pension fund will remedy the situation. Made in Kazakhstan, goods with this label now often emerge in foreign markets. At least this is what was said by the administrators of Export 2020 program. However, they fail to explain which of the final products of Kazakhstan are popular on the international market. For instance, two years ago it was sponges. More details in the next report. During the conference held in the Blue Room of the local administration, the representative of the National Agency on Export and Investments stated that the government is ever willing to cover the utility bills of Kazakhstani producers as long as they promote the domestic brands abroad. If Kazakhstani producers of goods and services spend money on advertising campaigns, create advertising videos, post ads in newspapers, magazines and other media abroad, the National Agency on Export and Investments would reimburse 50% of expenses at the end of the year. Presented advantages of the Export 2020 program seem rather controversial to gathered entrepreneurs. What possible activity abroad are we talking about when it's difficult to promote our products even in the neighboring Russia? We cannot distribute due to the single customs territory, we cannot enter the Russian market. I'm very much concerned as a citizen of Kazakhstan because I trace the increasing number of the Russian goods, while it's becoming more and more difficult to export our products. Meanwhile, the alcohol producers are also extremely concerned about the fate of domestic products. They complain that ever since the formation of the customs union, they cannot supply a single bottle of liquor to the Russian and Belarusian markets. There is a list of obstacles in the form of licenses, transport features and financial guarantees. I wish we could enter the Russian market because it's the best, however, we just cannot do it. That of Belarus is simply impossible. There is an alcohol monopoly in Belarus and it is accountable to Lukashenko. It's practically impossible to enter their market. Nevertheless, there is still something to be proud of. Two years ago, one of the factories propelled Kazakhstan to the top in production of sponges, which according to the CEO of GSC Kaznex Invest, Yerlan Arinov, were in high demand on Russian and European markets. They've moved a long time ago, I've been working here for three years already, they've gone out of business and vacated the premises two and a half years ago. Per official data, the export rate decreased by 21%, while the import increased by almost a third in two-month period during 2012. Despite the earlier mentioned sponges and kumis made in Kazakhstan, the country is still actively exporting oil, grain, fertilizers and metals. Serious shortage of fish is reported in Aral district. The processing plant of Atamekan Holding is on the verge of bankruptcy. The shortage of primary raw material is the main reason for frequent idle periods of the plant. Meanwhile, Atamekan Ribprom already received a euro code and had big plans for export. However, Russia, Georgia, Poland, Turkey and Austria are still not getting any fish from Kazakhstan. Find out why from the next report. During the years of famine, Volga region was receiving tons of fish as a humanitarian support from Aralsk, which saved lives of thousands of people. However, this was a long time ago, whereas Aral fish is rather in short supply these days, despite the fact that there is only one large fish factory in the region. No fish comes from the Aral Sea. We order it from Balkhash, the Caspian Sea and Zaisan. Whereas here, more than three and a half tons of fish disappear straight from the water bodies and we cannot trace it. It's a plain robbery due to the lack of control by inspection agencies and other relevant bodies. Ironically, there is fish in the ponds after all, however, fishing is prohibited. It takes a bit winter to receive a fishing permit. The smaller reservoirs have long been sold to private owners, therefore, this is not an option for the fish factory. In fact, the factory doesn't have its own fish farms. Atamekin Riprom, built within the framework of the forced industrial and innovative development national program, failed to gain the committed capacity of 6,000 tons. The variety isn't great either. The factory menu offers dried fish, smoked fish, frozen fish, minced fish and fish fillet. The newly appointed head of the region personally to on saving the Aral fish factory. Users of natural resources, manufacturers, carriers, security inspectors, environmental inspection, all of them are looking after their own interests. 
The innovation and industrial facility at the Mekendre Prom could be up and running at full capacity should there be a local product available. Yet, it is rather a wishful thinking and so are the stated plans, including production capacity increase to 48 types of products, providing additional 400 jobs to the existing 100 and geographic expansion of exports. The prospects seem very bright, while the reality is rather harsh. 722 rare Austrian cows were slaughtered in North Kazakhstan region. Animals were infected with virus diarrhea and Schmallenberg virus. According to the decision of Chief State Veterinary Inspector made on February 2nd, the disease will be eliminated and liquidated in two farms in North Kazakhstan region. The measures on eradicating the disease focus spread and extermination of animals went underway yesterday. The decision to resort to extreme measures was taken due to the lack of vaccine. The Schmallenberg virus is understudied. It is only known that the carriers of the virus are midges. The Austrian side has already apologized, saying that all of the animals were healthy when they inspected them. The material damage was never voiced. The news of exterminating 700 of imported cows caused outrage among MPs. Around 20,000 livestock heads have been imported to Kazakhstan and most probably, Soljan Mamadbek of Minister of Agriculture, will have to supply explanations to the parliament. This is our money. And as a person whose money has been spent on agriculture, I'm asking why did it happen? When I shop for groceries, I always think, what can I cook with the food that I buy? Why didn't they think ahead and assume that the animals would not adapt here? Why did they bring in so many heads? Why didn't they start with an initial experimental stock? Pavlodar journalist Fyodor Kovalev appealed to the U.S. President Barack Obama. In his letter, he asked Obama to influence American investors who violate the water level of Irtysh River. According to the journalist, foreigners are violating the interests of Kazakhstanis and cause tremendous harm to the Kazakhstan's environment. For several years in a row, the river Irtysh has been receiving insufficient water inflow due to meager compensation water allotment by the Shulbinskaya hydropower station owned by the American corporation AES. This compelling circumstance urged the Pavlodar journalist Fyodor Kovalev to write an appeal to the American president. According to the report, the foreign investors failed to comply with the commitment to expand the power station's dam, which resulted in considerable shortage of water. In my letter of appeal, I've asked the U.S. President to enforce the investment obligations to Kazakhstan on the management of AES Corporation. Currently, the American company makes excess profit from our water reserves just to pump the capital overseas, while we have to suffer the critical shortage of essential resources. Meanwhile, the lack of artificial flooding is becoming a serious cause for environmental concern, as the low water level and river pools results in winter freeze-ups. To prevent fish smoothering under ice, the fish farm specialists have to make ice holes and bottom land reservoirs of Irtysh River. The water level and fish kill prone parts that used to have considerable depth have now dropped below one and a half meters, which poses a major threat of fish suffocation. The ecologist Svetlana Magiluk has been monitoring the situation around the artificial flooding for several years. She's convinced that in case no preventive measures are taken on time, the largest river of Kazakhstan might significantly subside. The continuous degradation of the floodplains ecosystem is sure to result in decrease of the river's water content. This might not happen in the coming future, but eventually we may well find ourselves short of essential water supply. Although Fyodor Kovalev doesn't expect an answer from Barack Obama anytime soon, he still hopes to at least attract public attention to the major environmental problem. The journalist is convinced that the people of Kazakhstan realize the national importance of the river Irtysh, while the foreign investors are solely focused on making profit. The head of Association for Quality Medical Services criticized state officials who hinder the work of medical organizations. He believes that the paid clinics must participate in state programs, otherwise patients will continue receiving treatment abroad, as state hospitals leave much to be desired. Private medical clinics are pushing for a fair competition with their colleagues from the state hospitals for high-quality service and government assistance. The latter involves participation in the state programs such as training abroad and provision of medical services to the public via state funding. If a person gets sick, he may turn to any medical institution, be it private or state-owned, to receive a treatment. In turn, the state must pay for his treatment. But in reality, the system doesn't work that way. A person gets a free medical care only in public medical institutions. He cannot turn to private health care providers since the state doesn't have a contract with private institutions on provision of state-financed medical services. 
In the opinion of private clinic owners, this equal participation in the state programs will reduce the price of medical services and allow patients to choose their doctors and hospitals. Currently, the only barrier is the officials who create problems by selectively distributing the government contracts. For instance, imagine that this year we plan to perform 300 surgeries on the brain and spinal cord. However, officials issue no permission by stating that all of them must be performed only by Astana clinics. They do not take into account that I train specialists, procured medical equipment, bought all kinds of medical instruments and so on. In the meantime, in recent years, the officials from Ministry of Healthcare have been urging Kazakhstan citizens to select local healthcare providers over foreign. However, common practices shows the opposite trend. 24-year-old Nurjigit Kaidar suffered from gastritis for a few years and as a result it turned into stomach ulcers, so now he's engaged in self-treatment. I went to the state clinics and public hospitals where I saw endless queues. In order to see a doctor, you need to wait for more than an hour. So I went to a private clinic, but I found their services too expensive. That is why I'm engaged in self-medication, treating it with traditional medicine. If the patient's health allows and if he's willing to wait for his turn, the public health care promises unique health services. In Kazakhstan, some clinics have learned to transplant some vital human organs such as liver and heart. The surgeries that we perform in Kazakhstan could be set as an example to other clinics. They must not be afraid to start. Instead of talking and saying we don't know how to do it, they must ask themselves, what if we can? Unless we start, we certainly will not learn. We have set the motion. The statistics show the opposite. According to some data, Kazakhstan citizens spent about $250 million for healthcare services abroad. The patients have strong disbelief in local medical care quality for serious reasons. Astana re restaurants oppose the hookah ban. Businessmen don't see any harm in it, as opposed to the healthcare ministry, which demands to legally prohibit smoking of aromatic mixtures in public places. Arguments of both sides in the next report. The chief medical officer of the country with a hookah pipe in his hand is a rare picture to see. Jandar Big Bekshin resorted to this act with his colleagues to tell the terrible truth about hookah to Kazakhstan citizens. It is not simply a hookah, but a dangerous mix of toxic substances. Hookah doesn't cause any major harm, it brings pure relaxation, exactly what is needed in our daily lives during weekdays after work. Everyone smokes hookah, adults, youth and mostly girls like hookah. Midet Dugaev has been the hookah master for four years. The dose of this pleasure cost visitors on average $33. Similar to Medet, the manager of another restaurant, Maxim Kalambayev, doesn't share the criticism of the Ministry of Healthcare. He is not ready to cross out the hookah from the menu and cripple the profits. We are against the ban of hookah in restaurants because if the clients will not get it here, they will go to a different restaurant to smoke it. Kazakhstan doctors will not back down because of market arguments and habits of clients. Their research shows that liquid in the hookah contains dangerous viruses, so hookah fans risk getting infected with herpes and provoking cancer. The healthcare officials expect that legislation banning hookah smoking in public places will be adopted next year. This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.